Imagine a plan so absurd, so tragically flawed, that it led to one of the most senseless murders in recent history. Today's story isn't just about one of the world's dumbest criminals, it's about how a misguided attempt at love spiralled into a deadly scheme, leaving a small town in shock and disbelief. To fully understand this tale, you'll have to hear it all the way to the end. In 1988, a 33-year-old woman named Cheryl Petrie grabbed a candy bar off the rack inside PJ's Market, a little convenience store in Port Orchard, Washington, where Cheryl worked as a cashier. Without ringing up the candy bar, Cheryl simply handed it across the counter to a female college student who had just come into the store to talk to Cheryl. This student had temporarily moved next door to PJ's Market and, after meeting Cheryl, immediately took a liking to her. It became a routine for the student to visit the market almost every night, sometimes staying for hours just to chat with Cheryl. The student would talk about their day at school, their personal life, and share all their problems and secrets with Cheryl. Cheryl quickly became the student's confidant, but this was not unusual. Cheryl had this effect on many people. Cheryl was incredibly kind, empathetic, and a great listener. She never acted judgmental and never gossiped. She had a disarming sense of humour, often laughing at her own goofy jokes. People felt at ease around Cheryl and usually left interactions with her in a good mood. On this particular night, the student told Cheryl that they had found an apartment in Port Orchard and would be moving soon, meaning they would no longer be visiting PJ's market regularly. The student mentioned they had no money and would struggle to furnish the apartment or even buy groceries. Upon hearing this, Cheryl first congratulated the student, but then offered to give them some of her own furniture, insisting they take it to help furnish the apartment. Cheryl also grabbed a candy bar off the rack and handed it to the student for free, saying, here's your first grocery. The student was floored by Cheryl's generosity and tried to decline, insisting Cheryl keep her furniture and that they would pay for the candy bar. But Cheryl wouldn't hear it. She insisted, and the student finally relented, thanking Cheryl profusely. This behaviour was typical of Cheryl. She was a single mum raising a nine-year-old daughter and a baby boy, working two jobs to make ends meet. On weekends she worked at PJ's Market, and during the week she worked at a Ford dealership. Despite being swamped with responsibilities, Cheryl always found time to help others, whether it was assisting a co-worker with a resume or baking goodies for a sick friend at church. Cheryl was all about helping people, Cheryl lived in a small, blue, single-storey house tucked away in the woods, surrounded by tall trees. The road to her house was rural and winding, making the area feel isolated. Although it was a beautiful place, it was also a bit rough. A man had been shot and killed not far from Cheryl's house just a year earlier. But this home was all Cheryl could afford. She was poor and had almost nothing of her own, yet she was always more likely to give away what little she had than to keep it for herself. Eventually, Cheryl told the college student that she needed to get back to work and couldn't just sit and chat all night. The student thanked Cheryl again for the candy and the offer of free furniture, then left the store. Afterward, Cheryl reached into her pocket, grabbed some change, and put it in the register to pay for the candy bar. Even though she knew she could have likely gotten away with giving the candy away for free, Cheryl was unfailingly honest and made sure to pay for it. Cheryl continued working the register until 11 p.m., chatting with more regulars who came in and out. At 11 p.m., she locked the front door, balanced the register, and by 11.15 p.m., called her boss to report that her shift had gone fine and that she was leaving for the night. After locking up the store, Cheryl made her way to her beat-up silver sedan parked outside and began the drive home, knowing she would be back at PJ's Market the next morning at 7 a.m., at the same time Cheryl was wrapping up for the night, her ex-husband, Roland Petrie, who lived on the other side of town, was excited. This was the night Roland was going to win back Cheryl. He glanced at his watch and saw it was just past 11 p.m., almost time. He imagined how happy Cheryl would be when he unveiled his big surprise. She would run to him and he would hold her, telling her how much he loved her and how he had always loved her. Roland hadn't yet figured out how he was going to explain his plan, 
to win back his ex to his current girlfriend, but he figured he would deal with that later. The most important thing for Roland was showing Cheryl how wrong he had been, and how much he needed her, and how much she needed him. He also knew their kids would be thrilled if they got back together. Roland was looking after their son and daughter that weekend, and had seen firsthand how upset their daughter was about the separation. Roland and Cheryl had a complicated history, but Roland knew their breakup was his fault. They had met about twelve years earlier, when Roland was on leave from the military. At the time, Roland was a Marine sergeant and an accomplished judo instructor. He was handsome, charismatic, and had a charming Creole accent from growing up in a Cajun French family near New Orleans. Despite his appeal, Roland was a terrible romantic partner, having cheated on every woman he had ever been with and covering it up with elaborate lies. Nevertheless, Cheryl fell head over heels in love with him. Cheryl was insecure about her looks, despite having long auburn hair, beautiful blue eyes and a great personality. She felt plain and chubby and believed men didn't find her attractive. When she noticed Roland taking an interest in her, she felt incredibly lucky. They quickly got married, had a daughter, and almost immediately Roland began cheating on Cheryl. They divorced eight years earlier, in 1980. Around the time of the divorce, Roland's life fell apart. The woman he was cheating with was also married, and Roland concocted a plot to murder her husband. The husband was killed, but during Roland's trial, prosecutors couldn't definitively determine his role in the murder, whether he had done the killing or simply come up with the idea. Ultimately, Roland was found guilty and sentenced to six years in prison. Strangely, while in prison, Roland and Cheryl began reconnecting. Roland had an epiphany, realizing Cheryl was the best thing that had ever happened to him, and he had ruined it. He started writing her letters, apologizing for his infidelity and claiming he was wrongly convicted. Cheryl eventually began writing back, expressing that she still loved him. They remarried while Roland was in prison, and when he was released, he moved in with Cheryl and their daughter in Port Orchard. They had another baby together, their son, and Roland enrolled in nursing school. For a time, the family was back together, and everything seemed great. But eventually, Roland reverted to his old ways and began cheating on Cheryl again. They separated once more and started living apart. Fast forward to the night of October 15th, 1988. Roland was anxiously waiting to execute his big plan to win Cheryl back. He glanced at his watch, seeing it was now 11.30 p.m., go time. He stood up quickly, ready to put his plan into action, but suddenly felt so light-headed that he fell back on the couch and passed out cold. Roland had serious blood pressure issues and sometimes fainted if he stood up too quickly, which is what happened. When he came to, he was in such a mental fog that, instead of going out to execute his plan, he wandered upstairs, climbed into bed with his girlfriend, and fell asleep for the rest of the night. Cheryl was due back at PJ's Market the next morning at 7am to open the store and drop off the furniture for the college student. But when the first customers, including that student, arrived at PJ's Market, they found the door locked and the lights off inside. These customers knew Cheryl well and liked her. They knew she should have been there by that point. This was totally uncharacteristic of Cheryl. It wasn't long before they began calling Cheryl at her home, but she never picked up. Remember, this was 1988, so people didn't have cell phones and used landlines instead. It wasn't unusual to call someone and not have them answer. It just meant they weren't home. At first, people in Port Orchard assumed there must be a rational explanation for Cheryl's absence, maybe a family emergency or car trouble. That night, Cheryl didn't show up at Roland's house to pick up their kids. Roland didn't know Cheryl had missed work all day and assumed she was running late. By 6.30 p.m., when she still hadn't arrived and hadn't called, Roland finally called Cheryl, but she didn't answer. He left a cheerful message on her answering machine and waited for her to call back. Despite the upbeat tone of the message, Roland was worried. He was unhappy that morning when he realized he had slept through the night and missed his chance to win Cheryl back. He felt stupid for blowing the opportunity, but as the day wore on and Cheryl didn't return his call, his worry grew. Late that night, Roland called the police and reported Cheryl missing. A deputy came to Roland's house to take the report, and Roland gave the deputy a spare key to Cheryl's place. The deputy went to Cheryl's house, found it quiet, knocked, and got no answer. 
Using the spare key, the deputy let himself inside and found the home in perfect order with no sign of a disturbance. The deputy noticed a blinking light on Cheryl's answering machine, indicating there were unheard messages. He played them, hearing messages from Cheryl's daughter saying good night and I love you, from PJ's market customers asking why Cheryl wasn't at work, from Cheryl's boss expressing concern, and from Roland asking why she hadn't picked up the kids. Then came the last message, the one that made the deputy realize something was terribly wrong. It was from a stranger who said they had found Cheryl's purse floating in Lake Union near Seattle. The stranger wasn't sure if Cheryl's purse had been stolen and dumped, or if she had accidentally left it in the water, but they left a phone number for Cheryl to call to retrieve it. Lake Union was about an hour away from Port Orchard, where Cheryl lived, but she had no reason to be there. She never took trips, didn't have the time or money for even short ones like that, and her entire life was in Port Orchard her kids, her jobs, and her church. There was no logical explanation for why Cheryl's purse would be in Lake Union. Detectives from Port Orchard and Seattle linked up and began searching for Cheryl's car near Lake Union, thinking maybe she had driven there and lost her purse in the water. Lake Union is a busy place with lots of people, businesses, and houseboats, so trying to find Cheryl's nondescript silver sedan took time. But on the night of October 19th, Three days after Cheryl had failed to show up at PJ's market, police found her car near Lake Union. At first, it seemed like Cheryl might have driven there and abandoned the car because there was no sign of a struggle inside or outside the car. But when authorities popped open the trunk with a screwdriver, they immediately realized that couldn't have been what happened. Cheryl was in the trunk, beaten to death. The investigation into Cheryl's murder took more than a decade. Police started with Roland because he was her ex-husband and had a previous conviction for his role in a murder, even though the details of that case were murky. But Roland had an airtight alibi, with witnesses confirming he was nowhere near Lake Union or Cheryl on the night she was killed. Roland was cooperative with the police, even signing paperwork to allow detectives to search his home and belongings. He regularly contacted the police to offer any information he could think of, including an odd story about a young man who had been following Cheryl around in the days before she died. Although Roland didn't have much information about this young man, police interviewed virtually everyone in Cheryl's life. Friends, family, co-workers at the Ford dealership and PJ's market, and people at her church. But no one stood out as suspicious. Everyone said the same thing. Cheryl was an incredible person who was loved by all, and it made no sense for someone to want to harm her. A year after Cheryl's death, police got their first big break. A newspaper journalist contacted them, saying a young man had called him, confessed to killing Cheryl, and then hung up without giving his name or location. The call seemed like an anonymous confession just to get the secret off the young man's chest. The police convinced the journalist to write a story about the strange call to see if they could flush out the young man. When the article ran, one of Cheryl's former co-workers from the car dealership called the police, saying there was a young man who had worked at the dealership with them who was totally creepy and had a fixation on Cheryl. The co-worker said the guy's name was Al Brotsweller and he worked in the garage. Al was known as Odd, had a short temper, and creeped out all the women at the dealership. The co-worker mentioned that Cheryl had been helping Al with his resume, and during that time he developed a weird obsession with her. When police investigated Al, they discovered he had quit his job at the dealership a day before Cheryl went missing. A few days later, after Cheryl's body was found, one of Cheryl's colleagues saw Al with a deep cut on his hand, which he kept wrapped in a big bandage. Detectives also learned that Al's father lived near PJ's Market, and his mother lived near Lake Union, where Cheryl's car was found. Suddenly, Roland's previously odd story about a young man following Cheryl around before her death made sense, it seemed Al was the young man Roland had mentioned. When detectives tracked Al down, he was sullen and uncooperative, but eventually he told them he had cut his hand while fishing. The police interviewed the people Al claimed to have been fishing with, and they all confirmed his story. Even though Al seemed suspicious, there was no physical evidence tying him to Cheryl's murder, so he was let go, and the case went cold. In 2002, 14 years after Cheryl was murdered, a man in prison contacted the police, claiming he knew who killed Cheryl. 
He said the killer's name was Frederick J. McKee, who was currently incarcerated for cooking meth. The inmate, who was Frederick's cellmate, likely overheard Frederick say something incriminating, leading him to call the police. The police obtained a DNA sample from Frederick and compared it to the skin cells found on the duct tape used to bind Cheryl's hands when she was killed. Unbelievably, it was a match. Frederick was the killer. But as the police dug deeper, they realized that Frederick's heinous act of killing Cheryl wasn't the worst part of the story. The story of what really happened to Cheryl Petrie was so absurd and tragic that it became sensational news. It was covered in newspapers nationwide, turned into a true crime documentary, and even inspired a famous author to write a book about it. Here's what happened to Cheryl and the bizarre, tragic explanation behind it. Late on the night of October 15, 1988, the meth cook, Frederick J. McKee, ambushed Cheryl as she came home from PJ's market. We don't know exactly where the ambush took place, but it's believed to have happened right outside Cheryl's home. After ambushing her, Frederick forced Cheryl into her own car trunk, bound her hands, and savagely beat her. Cheryl put up a fierce fight, kicking, punching, and trying to escape, but Frederick eventually overpowered her by slamming the metal trunk lid down on her face repeatedly, ultimately beating her to death. Afterward, Frederick shut the trunk with Cheryl's body inside, drove her car to Lake Union and abandoned it there before tossing her purse into the water. But this terrible night wasn't supposed to go this way. Here's what was going on behind the scenes. At the same time Cheryl was closing up PJ's market and heading home, Roland was at his house anxiously checking his watch, waiting to launch his plan to win Cheryl back. His big plan was to save Cheryl's life. He had hired his friend, Frederick J. McKee, whom he had met in prison, and given Frederick a spare key to Cheryl's house. Frederick was instructed to sneak into Cheryl's home before 11 p.m., before she got home from work, and when she arrived, Frederick was supposed to jump out, ambush her, tie her up, and abduct her. Roland had even gone with Frederick to a hardware store to purchase the rope and duct tape for the abduction. The plan was that when Frederick began removing Cheryl from her home, Roland would burst in, save the day, and fight Frederick off with his judo skills. Cheryl would be so grateful that she would fall back in love with Roland, and they would reconcile and live happily ever after. But on the night of October 15th, when Roland saw it was time to go save Cheryl, he stood up too quickly, fainted, and lost consciousness. Instead of going out to stop the abduction, he simply went upstairs and went to sleep. This was a critical mistake because Frederick, the meth cook, believed he had been hired to actually abduct Cheryl, not knowing that Roland planned to rescue her. When Roland didn't show up, Frederick went through with the abduction, and things quickly escalated, leading to Cheryl's brutal murder. Both Roland and Frederick were eventually convicted of Cheryl's murder. By the time the case was solved, Roland was already in prison for attempting to kidnap the son of another ex-wife in a failed attempt to win her back as well. Roland was ultimately sentenced to 40 years in prison on top of the 25 years he was already serving, and Frederick received 20 years. Hey friends, if you found today's stories interesting, please subscribe to our channel and enable notifications, ensuring you never miss our weekly uploads. Your support is invaluable as we bring you new stories every week. Until next time.